My name is Adrienne Wood and I was um, Caddo's Lifelong Learning Manager from 2007 to 2015 and then I decided to take partial retirement by working in one of my favourite places in the world, Castle Cork. So I was a custodian there from 2016 until 2020. And although I knew, thought I knew the castle quite well, it's very different when you're just passing through a place as opposed to sitting in a room for an extended period of time. So after I'd started working there, I was opening up the castle one day and I noticed some things and I noticed some more things and I went and asked the boss, has anybody, why don't we talk about the 50 green men in the castle? And she went, what 50 green men? We've only got four. And I went, no, no, we've got 50. And then a bit more time passed and I started looking at the flowers in the drawing room. And I went and asked the question, has anybody ever looked at the flowers in the drawing room in terms of the Victorian language of flowers or floriography? And the answer came back, what's that? So I decided I'd have a little look myself and I got myself some um, flower meanings books and I started trying to identify the flowers in the room. And what I found is absolutely amazing. The entire room, every element of the decoration has been put there for a reason and has a meaning. So before we go into that, who was Lord Butte? His father was the man who built Cardiff docks and extended the city of Cardiff. And Lord Butte was born and his father died six months later. And Lord Butte became the richest man in Britain at that point. And there were all sorts of hassles with his childhood. Um, and he became an orphan at 12. And then there was a custody battle for him. Well, actually for his money, we think. Um, mm. But he managed to self-educate and he was a very, very interesting man. And I think that's why we've got such an, such an interesting room. So that is the drawing room. Um, I hope you've all been to see it in real life. Some people literally walk into that room and walk out two minutes later. And I've always assumed that was visual overload because it couldn't possibly be boredom, could it? Mm -hmm. um, but when the castle came into state care, the establishment, um, should we say, the architectural establishment clearly weren't very impressed. Um, it wasn't in vogue. And I will read you a little bit from the very first guidebook that ever came out about Castle Cork, which was printed in 1954. And it starts in its introduction. It's very welcoming introduction. Castle Cork is in many ways a gigantic sham, a costly folly erected in the late 1870s by an eccentric Victorian architect to satisfy the antiquarian yearnings of a wealthy nobleman. No prisoner ever moulded in its dungeon. Its courtyard echoed to the sound not of mortal combat, but of weekend shooting parties. Its portcullis barred the ways to nothing more dangerous than a dog cart. It was shaving water rather than boiling oil that was carried up the spiral staircase to the gatehouse battlements. So that really makes you want to go there, doesn't it? And if that person had done their research, they would have known that Lord Butte didn't do shooting parties because he didn't believe in cruelty to animals. Um, it did get better. The guidebook that came out in the 80s didn't really talk that much about the castle, but its introduction is quite good. It starts off with, Castes Cork is astonishing. It's a spectacular castle in the air, which was actually built, a pseudo medieval stronghold made possible by the combination of the wealth and enthusiasm of a great patron and the vision of his architect. It's one of the most romantic buildings in the British Isles. Now that bit he got right because what the drawing room is all about is love. There are stories on the walls, both the ones that are obvious in the Aesop's fables, but also others that are less obvious. And all the stories reflect Lord Bute's passions. He was passionate about what he called the mystic, which was a combination of astrology, astronomy, and the zodiac. He was passionate about family and especially his wife. He was passionate about nature and animals, he was passionate about religion and he was also passionate about medieval history and all of those themes are in this room but the one that we'll start with um, is floriography which is the meaning of flowers now flowers have been symbolic and had meanings probably for millennia but we started knowing more about that in medieval times when it was being written down 
So can I show you slide two, please, Alex? The picture on the right is Lord Bewes himself, and the picture on the left is his mother. Now, he only had the company of his mother until he was 12, but he obviously had very strong feelings for her. Um, and the picture's there really to show you the importance of not just what is in the room, but where it is in the room. So, if you look to the left of Lord Bute's portrait and slightly up, you can see a cage. And that is actually the um, Aesop's fable about the caged nightingale, which doesn't sing because it would only sing when it was free. And I don't think it's any coincidence that it's between their portraits um, because I think Lord Bute um, had a, a difficult childhood and perhaps he felt he wasn't free to sing. If you look to the right of Lord Bute's portrait, you can see about halfway up the picture, there is an iris. And that is between Lord Bute's portrait and Lady Bute's portrait. And the iris signifies jealousy. And Lord Bute said several times in the letters he wrote to his wife that he was jealous of her easy communication with other people. He was jealous of the way she was so well organized. He was jealous of the way she could turn down the begging letters that constantly arrive without offense. So every little thing on the walls has a meaning, but they never wrote down what they were or why they were there. So everything I'm going to tell you tonight is really supposition, but there's so much of it that it's seems believable. If you look above the portraits, they were always intended to be in the room because the ribbons that are hanging them up are actually painted. Um, and at certain times of the year, the portraits come down for um, restoration work and renovation work. And there are just absolute blanks behind them. The pattern doesn't go behind the paintings at all. Okay, if you want to go to the next slide, as you walk into the drawing room, in front of you, there is a fireplace and this marvelous statuary above the fireplace. The statues of the three fates and the fate on the left, Clotho, is spinning the thread of life. The fate in the middle, Lachesis, is measuring the thread of life. And I've completely forgotten the name of the fate on the right, but she's actually cutting the thread of life. Around them, which you can't see very well in this picture, there is a rope and the rope is getting frayed towards the end. And this signifies the three ages of man. So you've got a little baby under Clotho, a middle-aged person under Lachesis, and a man approaching old age under the, well, I can't remember the name of. But that's what it's to tell you about in regard to And that's what you can see. But the whole picture is a bigger story. Because if you look at the flowers on that wall, which surround that piece of sculpture, off screen on the left, there is a silene, which means young love. Then you've got the sunflowers, which mean long life and adoration. And you've got a little bit of wheat and some geraniums in there on the left as well. And that's prosperity and comfort. To the right of the three fates, you've got the hollyhock, which is fecundity, fertility. And that's important because Lady Butte had a whole series of miscarriages and they did wonder if they would have any more children after their first one. Then there's a calla lily in there, which is a magnificent beauty. And then right at the bottom right, there's a little um, anemone underneath the bird. And basically, if you read the whole wall as one message, it's saying that we have young love and adoration, prosperity and comfort. These are the three fates spinning the thread of your life. And I'm wishing you a very um, fertile, life, my magnificent beauty, with more expectation. So it's a big message which you wouldn't read, wouldn't know if you didn't know about the floriography. So if you'd like to go for the next one. On the walls are about 15 or 16 Aesop's fables. There are famous ones like the hare and the tortoise and there are less famous ones. In this case, we've got Aesop's fables and the Cats and the cheese on the left with the monkey. Um, the cats find a cheese and they are trying to work out how to divide it fairly. But when they break it, it breaks into uneven pieces and they can't work out how to make it fair. So they ask the wise monkey 
to even the cheese up for them and make it fair. So the monkey breaks a bit of cheese off and finds one half as bigger than the other. So he eats some. And then he finds that the other half is now bigger. So he eats some more. And then he finds the other half is bigger. And so he continues until there is just a small portion of cheese left. And the cats are getting increasingly unhappy. And eventually the monkey says, ah, the small piece of cheese left is my fee for solving your problem. So the moral of the story is don't get somebody else to get sort your problems out. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that's interesting about that particular picture is right at the bottom of the screen between the two cats, there is a pair of daisies. <coughs> and a pair of daisies means I reciprocate your affection. And there are pairs of daisies all the way around this room at the bottom of the Aesop's Fables frieze and in a couple of other places as well. And it's my belief that the pairs of daisies represent Lord and Lady Butte. Um, if you look at the second fable, it's the story of the quack frog, um, which is about a, a, a frog salesman who's selling this marvelous medicine to all the other animals. And he's doing a really good spiel and they're all falling for it. And then the fox says to him, well, if your marvelous medicine that cures everything is so great, why have you got warts all over your body? And then the other animals realise that they were just about to be had. But what's interesting about that is, is also in the background, um, because that fox is directly underneath Lord Butte's boat, uh, portrait. And you've got the pair of daisies again. But the meaning of the dandelion, that you can just see the leaves at the side of the screen there, um, underneath Lord Butte, the meaning of dandelion is, tell me if I'm wanted. And it's part of a bigger message. So... All sorts of messages in all sorts of places on the walls. If you do the next slide, Aled. Around the panelling at the bottom, you've got these carved borders of roses. You've also got a border of roses around where the panelling meets the walls, and you've got roses in every single room of the castle. And it might not surprise you to know that the rose <clears throat> symbolises love. It really is a romantic place. But if you look at all of these panels, I've just given you a selection of photographs at random. Um, every single one is the same yet different. They all contain three roses and, and some leaves, but none of them are the same. In fact, even each of the roses, if you look closely, is different from the other roses in that border. So you've got some with two layers of petals, some with three layers of petals. If you ever get to go into the castle, and look directly at the fireplace and then go to the first window alcove to the right of the fireplace, you'll find a little butterfly carved into that alcove um, border and a little moth on the other side. And I have no idea what those symbolise, but they're there. But all of the rest of these borders in the rest of the room are all just roses and leaves. Somewhere else in the room, there is one leaf that's been painted copper. And again, I have no idea what that signifies. Um, I would really wish they'd left a kind of instruction to the workers, the artists, you know, we want you to do this here and we want you to do that there. I did go down to the Victoria and Albert Museum in London because they've got all of William Burgess's notebooks there. And I waded through all 78 notebooks and didn't find anything that helped. I found lots mm -hmm. of pretty pictures though. And they also are things that do appear in the castle later. It's really difficult to decipher how much of what is in the room is Burgess and how much of it is Butte. When I started doing the research, I was convinced it was mostly Burgess, but as things have gone on, I've now come around to the idea that it's mostly Butte. Um, partly because I've also been up to Mount Stuart, the ancestral home of the Buttes, which was being refurbished at the same time as Castle Cork was being built. And many of the themes are similar and Burgess didn't work on that castle. So I'm thinking it is more of Butte. If you'd like to do the next slide, please, Alec. So the panelling, you can see a frieze of roses across the top of it. Um, again, they're all carved and painted gold. The current guidebook talks about this being a Japanese style decoration. But I think that's probably because the current guidebook was written by an, um, an expert in Victorian buildings rather than a medievalist because a medievalist would have told you that the reason the panels look as they do is because that's how um, medieval 
illustrations of flowers in books about flowers were shown. If you look at the next slide, Aled, this is an example of a page from a medieval book and it's got the same gold background and you can see the flowers and you can see little butterflies and things. Would you go back to the previous slide, please, Aled? Um, and when you look at those panels in real life, you'll find that several of them have got little butterflies, little bees, little creatures in them, as well as the flowers. And I do think that's a, a definite reference back to the medieval style. At first glance, when you go into the room, you see each set of three vertical panels, you think it's just one plant. But when I was looking in the room, because I used to spend my lunch hours there, um, I realized that some have got more than one plant in them and some have got as many as five plants in them. And that's what got me thinking that they might actually be more than meets the eye. So I started identifying them and um, I haven't managed to identify them all. There are still plants in that room that are, are too obscure for me to get a proper name on. I can see which family they are, but I can't see exactly what plant they are. Um, and once I'd identified them, I started looking up the meanings. And then I had a long conversation with Matthew Williams, who was the creator at Cardiff Castle, and asked him to come and see me in the room and talk through what I thought I'd found. This is about three years ago. And um, asked him if I, he thought I was being ridiculous or if I thought it was sensible. And he came through and he said, it all makes perfect sense to me. Keep, keep going, you know, you'll find more. And so once I'd identified as many of the flowers as I could, I started looking them up in the books. And then I started looking at the room and I realized that all of the panels, when you walk through the door, the panels to your left between the door and the fireplace, all tell the story of Lord Butte's relationship with the person whose portrait is above them. And the panels to the right of the room from the fireplace back to the door tell the story of Lady Butte's life. So if you go to slide number eight, please, Aled. So here are the, on the left, you've got the three panels, which are the vertical panels, um, which are directly under Lord Butte's mother's portrait. And the meaning of those, the white lilac means the first emotion of love, which is particularly appropriate for your mum. And underneath at the bottom of the left-hand one of the three, there's a small wood sorrel, and that means joy and maternal tenderness. On the panels to the right, um, the left of the three is white bryony, and that means be my support. And the tiger lily, which is the next two, is about female healing in relationship support. Again, entirely appropriate for his relationship with his mother. If you go to slide nine, please, Aled. Um, these are the pictures directly under Lord Butte's portrait. Now, I mentioned earlier on that he was a very unusual man. He spoke 23 languages, including Welsh, and he basically had private tutors all his life, and he was allowed to say what he wanted to learn about. So he was heavily into Greek mythology, Roman mythology, medieval history, all sorts of things. And it's my belief that he's put these particular flowers under his own portrait because they're very unusual varieties. So the purple flower on the left is a, an auricula, but I've never seen an auricula growing like that. They normally um, look more like a primrose plant in as much as they normally have their leaves at the bottom and a shorter stem. But it's definitely an auricula flower, just unusual leaves. The auricula means painting. The next flower, the blue one, is a cornflower, or it used to be called a blue bottle, and that means delicacy. And then above that, the white um, flower with the yellow center. You often see these today um, sold in packets of seeds for children to plant because they're a very quick and easy plant called the poached egg flower or limanthes, but um, they're only about three or four inches tall normally. And this one, because these flowers are pretty much accurate life size, this one's clearly a couple of feet tall. Apparently it's a wildflower in Ireland called meadow foam. But again, I haven't been able to find the meaning of that one. And at the bottom, there is a scarlet pimpernel and that means foretells tears. The right three are actually um, a buddleia, a buddleia globular, 
And that was named and described by a Scottish botanist, John Hope, in 1782. And you've got your Scotland connection there. And it was the very first Buddleia in cultivation um, in Britain. And it was being introduced by a prominent London nursery in 1774. So again, there's a little story there that we'll never know what the significance of that was, but they are all really unusual varieties under his own portrait. If you go to the next slide, Alan. So these <clears throat> are under Lady Butte, I think. Oh, well, hang on. No, they're not. They're in between them. So these sit between Lord Butte's portrait and Lady Butte's portrait. And the maidenhair spleen word at the bottom of the left-hand one means fascination. The aster means I share your sentiments. And the gelder rose, white flower viburnum, means age with friendship. So this is looking at their future together in the language of flowers. The dandelions is tell me if I'm wanted. Now the pink rose, it could just be a pink rose or it could be a damask rose and both meanings would work. One is happy love, will you love me? And the other is beauty ever new. So the press at the time, the Western Mail, which Lord Butte helped set up, um, was printing stories about the Butte's marriage, a bit like the press do today about celebrities, I suppose. They were saying it was a sham marriage. It was only for show. Um, they had no children. He went off and left her every winter. You know, it was a complete disaster. I don't think a sham marriage would put this kind of stories on the walls of its love nest. The reason they didn't have any children was because Lady Butte had had a series of miscarriages. And in fact, they decided that the next time she was pregnant, she was going to stay exactly where she was until the baby was born. And that's what they did. And they managed eventually to have four children. The reason Lord Butte went away every winter is because he had a kidney um, disease called Bright's disease. And he'd found that swimming in the Mediterranean every day for several weeks actually calmed his skin right down and would give him about six months relief from um, a version of psoriasis. And then he would go to Harrogate to bathe in the waters there every in between his trips to the Med. So there were good reasons, but the press thought it was just a loveless marriage. I think these flowers prove otherwise. Could you do the next slide, please? So underneath Lady Butte is just these three panels. And the lily of the valley means the return of happiness. The bluebell means kindness and constancy. The wheat means prosperity or riches, and that could be riches, not necessarily money. And the white lily means sweetness, purity, and modesty. So quite romantic messages. And if anybody gets married in Castle Cork um, and signs the register, they get the pink roses and the white lilies behind them. And I'm sure they have no idea of the romance that's sitting there on that wall behind them in their pretty pictures. So the next slide, please. Now, this is interesting. This was never in the plan. As you walk into the room through the door, this is to your right about two meters into the room. It's an alcove with a radiator in it. But when the castle was built, this is where they put the fireplace. And then they rearranged some of the other rooms and realized that if you wanted to make a grand entrance into this room, you had to move the fireplace to where it is now. So unlike the rest of the room, this isn't actually wood panelling. This is a trompe de l'oeil, it's just paint. And at the top of it, you can see there's a honeysuckle. And that actually, um, meaning of it is the bonds of love. And there are a pair of daisies at either end. So it's the bonds of love between the pairs of daisies. And the flowers in the alcove, I think are about religion. Um, or maybe what religion did for Lord Butte. So you've got the Nasturtium, which is conquest, the Narcissus Poetica, which is self-esteem, the King Cup is joy, the Geranium is home and comfort, and the Japanese Iris, which is on the right-hand wall, is about the heavenly royalty of Christ. One of the other alcoves is entirely focused um, on religion, and that's all in the wildflowers. 
as I said, this is a work in progress and we don't have all the answers yet. Would you like to go to the next slide, please? The doors. These are the main doors to the um, banqueting hall and the frieze around them, which has been beautifully done, um, is focusing on summer. So you've got butterflies and flowers and birds. And because it's such a romantic place, guess what kind of birds the birds are? They're lovebirds. Mm -hmm. The um, gilded flowers on the door itself, um, like a lot of the decoration in the castle, were done using a stencil. Um, all the hall decoration pretty much on the walls is all done through stencils. And at the bottom of the walls, either side of the door in this picture, you can see the red lines. Um, so this is, a, again, a hint back to the medieval. When you built a medieval castle, you didn't want to pay your stonemason a fortune to make all the interior walls smooth. So what you did was paid somebody a lot less money to plaster the walls with um, lime plaster. And then you painted the shape of the bricks on and often you had a frieze around the middle. And that's the way the hall's been done and also little elements of this room. Um, yeah, if you want to go on to the next one. So I mentioned that one of Lord Butte's passions was kind of the mystical side of life. Um, he had special machines built um, to apparently capture some kind of spirits. Um, there's information about those somewhere in his letters, um, but he was very keen on the Zodiac. In Castle Cork, you've just got these beautifully illustrated tiles to signify the um, Zodiac signs. But in Mount Stuart, he's made an entire um, upper floor of the entrance hall, which is immense. And the whole thing is Zodiac. And in fact, he set, had set into the ceiling little pebbles in the constellations where the sun comes through and, it, and really makes them gleam when you're there in the daytime. Um, absolutely fabulous there. It's worth a visit if you can ever go. But back to this, um, that's one of the 50 green men. Now the green man is an interesting thing. It was once a pagan symbol, um, but when early Christian churches started being built um, in the six, seven, eight hundreds, um, they had to bring some of the familiar into the church so that people felt comfortable. And the green man was one of the things that they brought into the Christian church. So you'll quite often find early churches have got green men carved somewhere in them. And it became a Christian symbol as a result. And it's um, the rebirth, which links with the rebirth of Christ. So if you go into the castle, there are two green men in this fireplace in the drawing room. There are two big and beautiful green men in Lord Butte's bedroom, and there are 46 in Lady Butte's bedroom. And you just need to look at the columns around the room and look at the top of the columns and you'll see the green men. And all the ones in that room are upside down. Now I know it has a different meaning when you make something inverted, but I don't know what that meaning is. Anybody got any hints and tips? I'd love to know. Other tiles in this fireplace, you can see the um, brown and yellowy amber ones. They're replicas of medieval tiles. So again, it's harking back to the medieval history of the castle and his passion. If you'd like to do the next slide. The ceiling. Well, the ceiling is magnificent and it's another research project all in itself. I haven't started on it. Um, there are at least three different types of stars. Some are five pointed, some are six pointed and some have got legs. There's a special name for those. While I was working there one day, a gentleman with autism came into the room and he stood there for about three minutes. And then he said, do you know there are I can't remember, something like 130 species of butterflies in this room. And I went, oh, have you been here before? And he went, no. And he just, you know, a bit like the rain man got that thing and he knew how many different kinds of butterflies. And then he proceeded to tell me that there were um, five less species than in the room in Britain now. And I went, well, that makes sense because this was done um, in the 1870s. And maybe there were five more species of butterfly in Britain at that point. Um, so at some point, somebody, maybe me, maybe somebody else, might identify all the butterflies and also all the birds. Mm -hmm. One of the things that puzzled me was an Australian visitor came in one day and went, 
that's an Australian galah. It's a kind of parrot. And I'm thinking, so how much did the Victorians know about Australian parrots in the 1870s and 80s? Not a lot, I thought. So how did that bird get on the ceiling? And then I happened by accident, really, to be looking in a, um, a medieval bestiary. And there was a beautiful painting of an Australian um, galah, which was done in the 1300s. And it turns out that those birds were captured in Australia um, and then were traded along the Silk Route to Britain and ended up being bought into Britain. And that's how it got into the 1300s book. And that's how it got onto this ceiling, I think. Well, you must have seen the book. But that is a project for another time. And it's going to be amazing when it happens. I'm just hoping to finally finish the flowers and maybe publish what I've been doing. Certainly, Cadu have said that they will put it in the Statement of Significance, which is the legal document about why the castle needs to be protected by law. So I'm probably about three quarters through my research. Who knows where it'll lead next? What's interesting is I, I forgot to say earlier with the Aesop's Fables, there is one Aesop's Fable, which is the biggest one in the room, and you can see it, and you can see what's happening in it, and I have no idea which Aesop's Fable it is. Apparently there's a professor of Aesop's Fables in California and I wrote to him and said, here's a picture of it, any ideas? And he went, nope. <laughs> and what it is, is, is basically there's um, a fig tree and a pomegranate tree and there are birds right through the trees and there are um, squirrels and monkeys eating the fruit and the birds are clearly telling the squirrels and monkeys off for eating the fruit. So you can see all of that. And if you imagine where Lord Butte's portrait is looking, he is looking directly at that story, which takes up an entire wall. And I can't find the story or the moral or the meaning of it. Um, so if anybody's a real Aesop's Fables buff and has a clue, I'd really love to know.